Let's start. Let's start then. Hey everyone, uh, can you guys hear me in the back? Awesome. So this is a session called Practical Caching in Drupal 8. Everyone asks me why this word practical is in there. I'll tell you later. Uh, I'm really excited to give that talk. Uh, and uh, I'd like to tell you a little bit about myself first. So uh, uh, I'm uh, Alexei Gorobet. Uh, in my native language, it's pronounced Gorobets, which uh, it's kind of hard to write. That doesn't really matter. So technical director at FFW Moldova. Um, Moldova is like a very small country in Europe, for those of you from US. Uh, I'm like five plus uh, in the Drupal community. I've been like active member forever since because I, I'm in love with this community. And uh, I'm a Drupal Moldova Association co-founder. So we, we grow Drupal talent and uh, we promote Drupal uh, in uh, our country. Uh, and uh, this session is about, uh, so um, probably you've read the like kind of agenda I put it on the side, but if not, uh, I'm gonna tell you what this session is not about. So I'm not gonna talk about how you would configure Varnish f to make your site uh, static cache faster. I'm not gonna talk about uh, a memcache as your key store. Uh, I'm not going to talk about any of those kind of uh, infrastructure things that everyone is uh, trying to talk about. And, well, that's kind of great things to, to know. But uh, at some point, uh, a developer approaches you and he's like, you know, I have a website and uh, uh, my content is not really up to date. And um, I... I bet it's caching, but I don't know how to debug this, and I don't know how to handle that. Uh, could you please help me? And uh, you can say, have you tried like clearing varnish cache? He's like, yeah, I did. Have you tried clearing Drupal cache? Yeah, it worked. So you still don't know what's the, where's the issue? He's like, no. So it, it's kind of great when you have this hosting provider that like throws all the things on you. You have memcache, redis, varnish. Uh, but it's really, it's really bad when your developer uh, like cannot handle the caching in Drupal 8 in terms of like developer perspective, right? So this session would be for developers, and we'll discuss caching techniques for developers mainly. So if you're an infrastructure guy, I'm sorry, but this is not for you. Anyway, so there are kind of uh, three things I want to talk about. Uh, there are three types of like caching that I would say that should matter for developers in Drupal 8, and uh, those are not new, no. Just like uh, my way of uh, categorizing them. Uh, this is the anonymous page cache, which we all know from Drupal 7 and 6. Uh, this is the reverse proxy caching. I'll touch very little on that. This is our like lovely varnish or whatever you put in front. And authenticated cache is one of the biggest deals in Drupal 8 that we're going to talk about. Uh, I'm just going to start with the uh, anonymous one. So anonymous page cache is implemented in a module called internal page cache. It's enabled by default. If you install just a regular Drupal website, Drupal 8 standard profile, you have this module enabled. It does everything for you. You even don't know what it does, but it already caches your pages. So th the reason like uh, I've put that here is I've seen so many people trying to debug an issue on the reverse proxy layer or the dynamic page cache, but they were actually facing an issue that anonymous page cache was serving the cache. And they were like, oh, I just like turn off all the caches and it's still serving. No. So this module, internal page cache, is what takes care of your anonymous page cache. Uh, in order to debug this and make it work for you, you need to understand how this module works. So I've uh, compiled a small like graph here that would show you that. So basically, uh, page cache in, uh, in Drupal 8 is implemented as a middleware. So when your request goes in, there are a bunch of middlewares that um, Symfony framework 
like kind of style coding uh, does with your request. And one of those middlewares is page cache middleware. So this is the component uh, that um, um, answers like to your, um, it, it tries to see if you can get the page from cache and if you can, it will definitely serve it. And if you cannot, it will not. Uh, and the first thing you, you'll get, you'll face the uh, what's called request and response policies. Those are pluggable. Those are pluggable policies that you could implement your own. But Drupal provides its own uh, default ones. So the first thing uh, that Page Cache Middleware does, it checks for the request policies. If any one of them denies this cache to be retrieved. Uh, this page uh, uh, to be retrieved from cache, you're not going to get the page from cache. So if like everyone allows that, the page would be looked up in your anonymous page cache, would be searched from the cache, and if it denies that, of course, it would go to Drupal and uh, uh, like uh, regenerate the page for you uh, from grounds up. So uh, the same happens when the cache uh, key is not found in your page cache. It would go to Drupal to regenerate it. Uh, the second thing, after the cache was regenerated, or um, um, like you basically got uh, Drupal to generate that page cache, there is a response policy which um, uh, kind of decides if the page should be set or it should be skipped. Is it a good cache? Is it a good page cache? Should we set that cache for other users, or should it be skipped? And if it's uh, skipped, of course, it's not set. And the next request with this similar uh, parameters would just skip it again because it will not be cached. But if it's OK to cache that, if it's an allow, allow then it will set the cache. There are two default uh, request policies that you need to uh, track. Uh, this is the uh, not CLI. So if a re request comes from a command line interface, it will not retrieve the cache from the page from cache. So again, request policies respond about should I look up the cache or no. And if it's an open session, if you are logged in, it will not retrieve those from the cache. So two basic ones uh, at the moment of writing that presentation that are default in Drupal. There are response policies as well. And the response policies are where like the tricky part comes in. Like developer comes in and says, Dude, I don't want to cache that page. Why is this caching? I'm like, OK, let's see. So there, is, there are three ways to manipulate the page not to go into the anonymous page cache. First, this is a page uh, kill switch. It's like a service that you can trigger that kill switch, and the next page request will not be cached. There is a route uh, option that you can specify in your route. If you specify the route option no cache, the route will not be cached. And there is a no server errors policy, which means if there is at least one server error, uh, this uh, page will not be cached. It doesn't need to be cached if there are server errors. Those are by default again. But if you want, you can implement your own. Let's see how those kill switches work. If you want to bypass the anonymous cache, not actually bypass, but not save that page to the cache, is what you're doing is in your code you do something like this you call the service page cache kill switch and you just trigger so the trigger will trigger the flip and this page will not be cached or you can specify no cache true in your options for your route and that is also going to work so if you want like your custom way to skip the anonymous page caching not just anonymous but I'll get to that you can see we're taking this service with two tags here, which one, uh, uh, one is the page cache response policy and another one is dynamic page cache response policy. You can use the same response policy for both anonymous and authenticated uh, cache, but we'll get to that later. So if you want a cache policy of your own, you just define a service, you tag it with the proper tag, you take it with the page cache for the anonymous cache, with dynamic page cache for the dynamic page cache, uh, and you can tag for both. And you can then check for some like custom condition. For example, you can check for your URL containing the intranet 
uh, like what I do here. And if it contains the intranet string, then you're denying, uh, basically, your uh, response policy says deny, and this would not be cached. You don't want to cache your intranet, probably, for anonymous, at least. So this is anonymous page cache. And it's really important to uh, take a look at this. So uh, I'll put the slides on the web. Uh, just go through it. You can go through a debugger, but make sure it's there. Make sure you know how it works. Uh, the next thing I wanted to cover is uh, reverse proxy cache. So there's not much really to cover here. Everything is uh, what we had in Drupal 7. But one thing to note is like to enable your reverse proxy caching, the one like one and only switch for that would be you just set your page cache expiration age, which would set your cache control headers and you should be done. So another thing to note is of course if you want to track your IP address correctly uh, from the reverse proxy then you should set uh, the reverse proxy uh, IP address header and other headers that you want um, to get from your reverse proxy because your reverse proxy would terminate the request and uh, your web server will get a new request that might not have the correct server, uh, the correct headers. You'll get the IP address of the reverse proxy, for example. Uh, you also need to put all your reverse proxy uh, IP addresses in the trusted um, list of IP addresses so nobody tries to spoof uh, on you. That's basically it. So the biggest, biggest, biggest thing in Drupal 8 is authenticated cache. If everything else before we already had and we like knew how to handle that, this one is uh, new and uh, like in Drupal 8, uh, Drupal cons lately, everyone is discussing that. Uh, uh, there is every session about cacheability metadata, and this is one of them. Uh, but I, I kind of mixed it with some practice, so we'll see. So caching, for it to be good, has to have uh, a high heat ratio, so you don't like waste your uh, connections, you don't like waste your server time, you want every time a, a user comes for the cache to be a hit. Uh, you want the cache to be up to date, of course, you don't want your content to be uh, stale, and you want the caching like to be easy to invalidate. You want a lower like cache complexity, cache invalidation complexity. So and the problem with those uh, caching uh, like uh, features that we want is you can usually choose only two of those. Uh, you know that project management uh, triangle that says uh, like you can do budget, scope, or timeline, and uh, only two of those. This is very similar. Uh, so if you want a high cache uh, uh, hit radio and you want it up to date, then you probably need a very complex invalidation system. And uh, if you you want uh, like a very low invalidation system and a high heat radio, your cache is, is probably not up to date. So this is kind of problem what Drupal 8 uh, is trying to solve, and Drupal 8 is trying to make a like invalidation mechanism that is still very lightweight and easy to understand, but it works for us. So, of course, there are two known hard things in the computer science, and one is cache invalidation, and the other one is naming things. And uh, cache invalidation is not really an easy task to do. And uh, Drupal 8 does that well, so I'm pretty surprised, but uh, using cache metadata. So cache metadata is uh, the thing that you probably heard of but I'll just cover more uh, in that presentation. So we have uh, a theory start for the practice. Um, basically, like let's see how we can solve those problems. So we have a personalized content that needs a more granular cache. So you can't cache this content for everybody, but you need to rather cache it, for example, by username, because that's the username block. Uh, so you want to cache your admin links block uh, by permissions because the links uh, 
will be different if the user has different permission. And of course, like the help block in Drupal is like generated by URL. Each URL is different help block. So that's a very old module, but that's how it works. Uh, you don't want to cache that permanently. You want that regenerated by URL. So uh, the solution for that in the cacheability metadata comes as cache contexts. So you can specify the thing that you vary on uh, in your cacheability metadata as cache contexts. And you can say that my cache should vary by user, so every specific user will get a different cache. My cache should vary by user permissions, so like a hash of permissions would be calculated. And if a user has different permission, they will get a different cache. And I want to cache my context, uh, my cache by URL. So every URL will get a different cache. So that's a solution to like personalized and uh, um, different cache for the same object, but different circumstances, different context. So th there also are dependencies that you want to track. And uh, one of those uh, things in Drupal 7 that was so hard to do is you have like a node and you've updated the node and you, you had that expire module, uh, cache expiration and purge module that the node page would invalidate uh, on your varnish server and uh, you're just uh, fine now. But then there is a different problem that this node was included on like 10 other pages that you don't track. So the problem of tracking dependencies is very hard. So if you don't track dependencies, it's very hard to invalidate that node cache on a different page than the node URL. You would basically have to like compute all the dependencies and like uh, uh, gather all the URLs uh, of uh, the pages that this node has and it's really hard to do from the node level that node was just saved. It's hard to track that. So the solution for that in Drupal 8 is cache tags. So when you set the cache uh, in uh, your um, uh, backend, you can, uh, in your code, you can set what this cache depends on, and you can set uh, either an entity uh, type, entity ID, like user uh, column one, or you can set some generic tags that are, that are already invalidated uh, by Drupal. For example, each uh, view that lists nodes, so if it lists nodes, it has the node list cache tag. So you can say that every time a node is uh, updated, then please, please clean all the uh, uh, caches for, for the views that list nodes. So it's easier when you set the cache to set the dependency as well with it, so it's very easy to track what should be invalidated. And that's the cache tags. So then you want to decide, should I cache this for how long? Like, is it uh, worth caching? Uh, uh, maybe it's too granular, too personalized, too dependent. Maybe I don't want to cache that. So you control that with the cache max age parameter, and you can basically say permanent cache by setting minus one, or you can say no cache by setting zero, or you can say a number of seconds that you'd like that to be cached. And um, that's really like depends on your use case, but I guess the like you would vary with minus one and zero most of the times because uh, with all those other tools that you have, you basically want a cache hit radio and you have that invalidation mechanism that can invalidate and you don't need to set a cache lifetime most of the times, uh, at least for the dynamic page cache. But it really depends on your uh, use case. So let's take a look at some example. This is a render array uh, of uh, the Bartik branding uh, like header in your uh, Drupal website which has the logo, the site name, and not much. So we want to cache that uh, branding block. And this is a, a block, which is blocks are entities. So this is cached in the database or whatever storage you're using, memcache. Uh, this is cached as entity view block Bartik branding key. The uh, computed key would be that long, right? So 
it doesn't depend let's say on anything it doesn't vary on anything because you really like every page has the same branding uh, block but it really depends on something uh, like external dependencies and it depends on if a block uh, representation or a block let's say preprocess or something was changed you, you have a template for the block and this was changed somehow so the block render array was cached and the, the full render was cached and you actually want to invalidate all the blocks on the site. So when you want to do that, you just invalidate the block view tag. So this uh, branding um, uh, block also depends on what's configured in your site name. So if your site name changes, you actually want to invalidate that header block. So uh, this is why it says config.system.site. This is the config it depends on. And also Bartik has this fancy feature that you can use the color module and like uh, play with the color of your, um, but that's not it. No, that's something else. Anyway, uh, and you can see that this uh, block is actually worth caching permanently because there is not much change. There is not much change occurring. So we want a high cache hit rate. So we cache it minus one. The next thing I'd like to cover is uh, the cache metadata bubbleability. So what is bubbleability? Uh, it would be hard to explain, but uh, I'll take an example. So you have this username custom block uh, that has the following cache metadata. So username just shows the username, right? So the username is cached in the key, like username, user ID. The key doesn't really matter for now. It doesn't vary by any circumstances, like the context are empty, but it depends really on the user block um, cache because the user block might have different settings and you want to invalidate that. And it depends on the user. So if a user changes his username, you want to invalidate that block. Then you have like the username block is rendered inside a region like header region for example so that header region renders that block and that block has some dependencies has some uh, cache metadata that it depends on something external or it varies by something so that header may not be cached by itself without considering his child dependencies because if the header is cached the child will forever be cached even if the header like uh, even if you invalidate uh, the child, the header will still be cached. So you have to bubble up, you have to provide more context to your external uh, region, external block that shows that guy. So this is why the header region will inherit the cache metadata from its child, from the username block. So essentially, bubbleability would be uh, the header region by itself depends only on the config system site because if you change the site name, it has to be invalidated. But because it has the username block in it, the username configs will bubble up to the region, to the region uh, um, render array, and they will be merged. And the region itself, the header region, will get both cacheability metadata of the user, username block and his own. And the same happens for other children, so if you region uh, if a region has multiple blocks, all of them will bubble up the cacheability metadata to the parent. So that makes us, uh, that allow us to track dependencies on a way, way like better scale and level that we can invalidate things and not just the ch children, but the parents that will, uh, will also be invalidated. So, and the page rendering this region now is rendering the header region and rendering other regions. But header region depends on the username uh, itself and on the site name. So both of those would bubble up also to the page level cache. And your page level cache would get this uh, cacheability metadata. So when you invalidate, like you save your user or you change your site name, the page level cache will also be invalidated. So 
let's take a look at this very simple website as an example and see what um, cacheability metadata uh, we, can, uh, we can find. So uh, we'll take the first um, site install uh, uh, the header and uh, uh, you tell me what cacheability metadata uh, this uh, block has. So context, tags, and uh, whatever. Let's, let's cover those two. What do you think? So let's let's take the first question. So site name is for text because if you change the site name, this block has to be invalidated. User, user, user is not there. No. No, no, no. My my account is different. I'm just highlighting this one. You can see the like yellow yellow thing. So just the site install and the logo. Does it depend on anything else? Just the site name? Or the, logo. the logo, okay. I can configure a different logo, for example. Maybe. Okay, let's take another example. Let's take this menu. Bookmarks, query. Oh, menus. Yeah, so there's the menu, the, the main menu. What do you think it depends on? So what it varies on? And what it depends on is external dependencies that have to be invalidated. Let's start with what it varies on. User access. User access. All right, because like links will be different depending on user. Is it like user permissions or user role? What do you think? User role, user, role, user permission. Basically, it's user permissions. The it's just taking all the roles and uh, all the permissions, compiling a hash of permissions because you you can have like multiple roles and it's going to be hard to do like all the permutations and uh, identify that this is the same set of permissions. So basically, all permissions are hashed and it caches by the hash of permissions. So okay, uh, what else? Menu items. Menu items. Oh, if you change the menu itself, it has to be invalidated. So is that context or tags? That's tags. All right, let's take another one. Uh, that's the search block. So what do you think it varies on? Configuration, obviously, because I could configure to go to a different search page, for example. What else? Permissions. Absolutely. User role. Same with permissions. Yep. For example. What else? Context URL. URL. That's very. That's awesome. So because can you tell why? Correct. Yeah. So if you put something in there in that user block, and you search for something that has to carry the current keywords from the URL in that block, right? So it will vary by URL uh, every time. So let's take another example. Uh, let tools menu, for example. What it varies on? Permissions, Permissions correct. Same things as, uh, as the primary navigation. Correct. Uh, a little bit different things, maybe. So in Drupal uh, uh, 7, we had the, a way to configure the main menu and the secondary menu. And you could switch that in just a setting. And here, you can configure also the tools menu. You can say which menu to use for the tools. And th this varies. Uh, this doesn't vary, but this depends on this configuration, right? So that's a tag. All right. Let's take this one. Bookmark this. I know it's hard to see. Bookmark this um, link. What it what it varies on? Let's say user, user URL. Why? Think more a little bit. Entity ID or something. It could be, but we don't know. 
if you just look here, what it would depend on? It, it would depend, what's, that's a flag module, you know, flag module? Anyone use flag module? I think everyone should. Yes, so, I would say, can we say it depends on the flag state? It's flagged now or unflagged? So you cannot show the same URL for people who flagged or unflagged it, right? It's different. It would be bookmark this and unbookmark this or something, right? A user, because the flag could be per user or the flag could be global. So this is kind of like how context can arrive dynamically. And uh, what else? All right, let's take another one. Uh, in the corner, the username menu, the user menu. It's called the user menu, right? What it depends on, uh, like what, what it varies on, let's see. User? I don't see any user specific thing there. Oh, hmm. What if it goes to slash user only? Oh, yeah. Totally. So what would the logout link depend on? Uh, no. Status? status? Yeah. Like, what kind of status? Role. That's the user role. So the logout link varies on the user role. So. If we take all of those that we just described, all of those uh, varies uh, uh, contexts and all of those tags, like external dependencies, and we look at that page, all of those would bubble up right to the top of the page cache. So your page cache would vary on all of your contexts that we just described and would depend on the external dependencies to be invalidated for all the tags that we just described, right? So that's how bubbling works. All right, awesome. One other thing about bubbleability and context metadata is they are hierarchical. So if you if you take like um, in one sentence that's like more uh, general ones consume the more uh, like specific ones. So uh, for for that example, for that specific example. If one of your uh, blocks depends on just the query arguments in your URL, but another one depends on the full URL, including query arguments and path, the URL already has the path and the query arguments in it. So you don't want to depend on two things and one thing does the second. So they are consumed and only the most like general one is used. So any of those variations of those uh, cache uh, tags would be consumed by the URL. So URL would consume those and only the URL would be registered. The same thing happens for the user. If you depend on the user role, but some other block that shows the username depends on the user itself, that user itself is already more granular than the user role. So you don't want to have both of them because you'll have too many variations, right? But you want to have just the most like general one that consumes the others. So th this is how hierarchy works. So if um, the prefix of the cache uh, tags uh, includes like or starts with uh, is the same, so the, the tail is just dropped and uh, the context uh, the tags are consumed. All right, so that's a really powerful tool to make your cache not too variable and not too uh, too many dependencies on it. So yeah. Uh, so let's see how we can actually cache our stuff from developer perspective. So if your operation is consuming uh, too much uh, uh, cycles you probably want to cache it. You have to decide if it's worth caching. So if you want to cache it separately and specify a cache key, so for it to be cached in a separate storage, you just specify a cache key and you can invalidate that cache key later. You specify the cache keys. 
So if your content spe is specific to several conditions, you use uh, the cache context, right? If your cache depends on some other like external dependencies to be invalidated when someone else is invalidated, you use the cache tags. And if you want to change something, like if you want the cache lifetime to control it, you use the cache moxage. Those four are cacheability metadata that you can provide in your render arrays and other stuff that I'll show you. So let's take a render array, like a basic render array that renders some stuff that's expensive to calculate. And it has the username and the URL in it. So what cache metadata do we want for that? Who can tell? So let, let's start with the keys. How do we make that cache, like in the cache storage? What keys do we specify? User ID, okay. Is just the user ID? So this block is somewhere printed, right? We want to cache that block somewhere. We want to specify what it varies on and we want to specify external dependencies. But somewhere to cache that block, we need to specify a key for this to be set in the database or yeah. whatever storage. That key should be? Stuff. stuff. Great key. <laughs> so uh, uh, cache context, what it varies on? Username and URL. That's very obvious, right? <laughs> All right. And uh, what it depends on, external dependencies. The user, correct. And which user? Yeah, so that would be the user, user ID, right? All right, let's see the results. Uh, expensive stuff, actually, and not stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but you were close. So uh, the keys and the context, you don't have to put the uh, dependency on the username and URL in the key itself, because what essentially contexts do, they compile a longer tail and append to the key. So you can put your key whatever you want, like my module name, expensive stuff. And then the context are going to compute to a string, and this string is going to be appended to your key when it goes to the storage. And the same thing would be to retrieve that. So uh, uh, the keys are very lightweight. You don't put everything in the keys. Uh, you depend on the user and URL. You were correct. And the text is uh, user column user ID. So if a user one, whatever user, uh, is uh, updated, this uh, cache will be invalidated. Awesome. So what happens if my content is like too dynamic? Yep. Oh, oh, you look at the code. <laughs> uh, you look what Drupal uses. You, you can look for uh, who implements the cacheability, um, uh, I don't remember the name, cache context interface or something like that. So if there is a cache. Right. Thank you. So you just look, look up who implements that. Uh, yeah, so if you have too dynamic content, it's too expensive uh, to uh, calculate uh, every time. And it's, it's really not worth to cache, for example, because it's really dynamic. Uh, like uh, contextual links uh, that appear on every block if you're an admin user, right? So uh, like your page content is not updated uh, but you just have a flag in it that has to be different every time a user clicks on it. And it depends on the user, for example, that's a user flag, and it also depends on the flag state. And another option uh, and another thing is you have many links, and you will not believe me, right, but many links have the active state, right? So basically you would have to vary that many links block like the menu block based on the URL every time because you have the active state that you have to track. 
So it's kind of a problem. We have all those kind of tools, but we have so many dependencies that would make it too dynamic and not worth caching. So there are solutions for that that Drupal 8 is already doing. Uh, the first solution is JavaScript, of course. So there are custom things that you can do for your own module if you can't really benefit from cacheability metadata. And that's what we're doing with uh, uh, contextual links, with menu links, for example. So menu links will actually uh, put some uh, data attributes when the menu link is rendered, and there will be some JavaScript reading those data attributes and setting the active class for you uh, on the uh, client uh, side. So there is no need to cache that active class for you. That's uh, really nice. And the contextual links use a technique called uh, it, it's not no. It, it uses its own like placeholder instead of printing the contextual links. So the placeholder would say where to get contextual links and what is the cache key, let's say, for the contextual links, but it will not actually render those contextual links uh, on the first uh, run. It will render on the second in JavaScript. Uh, and another technique is called placeholders and lazy builder. And uh, uh, Fabian Franz uh, mentioned that uh, a little bit on his yesterday presentation. That's a really cool technique when you, that you can use with uh, like alternative uh, uh, page rendering mechanism or like big pipe. And I'm sure there will come uh, a lot more of that. So uh, if you want something to be like big pipe enabled and to be served as the second AJAX request or like just streamed to your page when it's ready or anything that can use placeholders, you can, you can use instead of uh, rendering your uh, content in your render array, you can use a technique called lazy builder. So what you're basically doing is you're specifying a callback when this content wants to be served, this callback will generate the content, including all the, uh, and you just specify the, the parameters to that function. So basically, that's a function that everything it needs to render the content is passed inside. So there is no like external dependency in that function or, or method, right? So uh, this is an example of how flag module does its flagging and unflagging link. Uh, it uh, forces creating a placeholder, and a little bit on that. So when you specify a lazy builder, uh, you have two ways to make it a placeholder. You can force it. You can say create placeholder true. And every time some rendering like big pipe occurs, it will just take this lazy builder and it will uh, like first put a placeholder, and then Big Pipe will uh, serve the uh, remaining content um, and replace the placeholder. And uh, if you don't put the create placeholder, there is a way like auto discovered placeholders. So uh, some contexts, some tags may be too uh, like too dynamic, and you can specify in your settings PHP file which one of those are really important for you, which one of those are really dynamic for your website. And this kind of uh, placeholders, this kind of cache context will be auto placeholdered uh, by your website. So as a module developer, you can leave that option for a website uh, maintainer and user, uh, or you can hard code the create placeholder. Uh, Contextual links use its own technique uh, that's not using placeholdering, uh, but uses a very like similar approach. Basically, it, use, uh, it uses JavaScript uh, and uh, has a data attribute for contextual links. So this one is rendered, but contextual links will appear for you only if you have permission to access those contextual links. And this is calculated by your user permissions and stored in JavaScript, it's cached. And it will replace your contextual links afterwards. So let's do a little bit of practice. So I know we've talked about render arrays and uh, stuff like that, but like what I've seen people are doing is still they can like return a regular response in the controller. And I have a like question to you. 
Will this response be cached? Who knows? Yep? Yes, yes that's a perfect answer. <laughs> Another answer? No? Oh, <laughs> you're asking too much. No, <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, it has to be, right. I'll show later. OK, so will this one cache? Who knows? So the only difference is this one has admin route true as an option. It, it won't. That's correct. And the previous one also won't. Because if you want to cache something, it's not enough to return a response object. You have to return a cacheability response, cacheable response object. And that's kind of thing that everyone overlooks when developing something uh, like custom, like a custom API response that what they do. Nothing is cached by default if you just work with response. You have to return a cacheable response and provide cacheability metadata for it. So in this time, will it be cached? No, because there's no metadata. Why not? What does add cacheability dependency say? <laughs> yeah, this will be cached. So finally, we have a cached response. That's uh, awesome. And let's take a look at another example. So uh, you can either return from your controller, you can either return a response object or anything that implements response interface. And cacheable object, a cacheable response is really what you want to do, uh, want to return if you want to cache it. Or your controller could basically return a render array, right? So that's the basic thing to do. So if you work with render arrays already, you probably have more knowledge of cacheability and uh, like it's e way easier to do. You don't have to keep that in mind. So will this one cache? Uh, the answer is no, and this is because max age is zero. Correct? OK, let's take a look at this one. Will this one cache? Yes. And another answer? Or you have a syntax error. OK. The, this is a tricky question. That's my answer. <laughs> because this depends on your uh, Drupal settings that you specify for cacheability metadata. So by default, Drupal provides some of like default settings that you can tweak. But you can really say, which cache contexts and which cache tags, like which cacheability metadata are not worth caching. And if you specify that in your settings PHP, none of those will be cached. And by default, Drupal comes with a setting that says, if something varies by user, we don't cache it. So this varies by user, so it's not going to be cached in default Drupal settings, right? But you can tweak it depending on your own like needs, and this will cache. That's a good exercise. So you don't need to know everything about cacheability metadata, debug it manually, because there is an awesome tool. Uh, Fabian Franz was showing a little uh, video yesterday about it. And this is the tool you want to use, probably after some patches applied and, you know, uh, it's still a prototype, so uh, you can find it on the project RenderViz, and uh, it's on Drupal.org, and it requires a, a Drupal 8 patch, but that's really easy to do. Uh, so what this tool does, basically, when you load your page, you look at the console, and you can see all the cacheability metadata bubbled in your page. You can see all the cache tags, you can see all the cache contexts, and you can see a list of those. 
So you can query for some specific cacheability metadata and you can find which elements on your page have it. So for example, if someone is saying, no, 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 don't cache that page uh, and setting a max age zero and you don't know who does that, you just see that your page is not cached, you can use that tool and query for uh, like uh, um, max age uh, zero. This one says uh, context route. I'm looking for everything that depends on the route, varies on the route. But you could say max age zero and that would like pop up all of those elements on your screen and you will be able to see all of those and navigate through those and find like the actual guy who's doing that. And then you're gonna do a git blame probably, find a developer and teach him some cacheability metadata lessons. All right, that's how we do it. So another good thing about that, even if the whole like uh, 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 visual thing doesn't work for you, what I found useful with that module is it prints cacheability metadata in your DOM so you can see some comments about each and every block what cacheability metadata it has. And you can even see what cacheability metadata it had before bubbling and after bubbling. So you can see how those things bubble up and you can see if here's the, like, um, here's the guy that you need to optimize or he just inherited that from someone else. What I'd like to say is like, I usually don't cache my rendered output, but what I do, when I do, I do it permanently. So if you want to get the best experience out of, uh, for your users uh, and make the, like, the highest hit rate, you probably want to cache everything permanently. Uh, other than some stuff that you don't want to cache, right? So with this kind of uh, interesting ways to invalidate your cache, I encourage you to look at the cache metadata like closely, learn it, teach your developers, and cache as much as you can. So uh, this all couldn't be possible without Wim Leers and Fabian Franz working on this so long and giving so many presentations that inspired this talk. So I'd like everyone to give a loud applause to them. Thank you for their work. Thank you. And if you want, <laughs> and if you want to join uh, the session, the, the sprints uh, on Friday and help uh, develop, debug, and uh, fix the render viz and uh, whatever is left on the cacheability thing to do, uh, I encourage you to join the Friday Sprints. Um, and please, 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 evaluate my session. I need feedback because this is my first DrupalCon session. So... <laughs> And now we can start with some questions. Yep. Uh, I think you need to use the mic. Um, specifying max age is nice, but can I do specify a min age as well? So imagine um, a comments block on a highly frequented page on the front page, which I don't want to invalidate on every new comment on that page. Uh, I don't think you can. N not yet. Okay, thanks. The support in the renderer would be there. It's just not yet done. Awesome. <laughs> to repeat that, uh, in general you can, but it's not yet done. <laughs> <laughs> All right, two questions. The first question is you were talking about ways to find out when, when somebody's not caching something that should be, and then you said you could do a pull request and go find that person. Uh, is there uh, is there another option? Uh, is there a way to alter the cache settings on something uh, via some alter hook or whatever? Yeah, cache settings on alter uh, on render array. So everything you can alter, like every render array can be altered, right? At any point in time, if there's someone providing an alter hook. So just alter that render array. Yeah, you could do that. 
And the second question, you were talking about how you, you want the, the cash hits to be, to be really high. What, are there any specific tools that you use for monitoring the cash hits? Mm, yeah, I think, uh, so you, you could look at the memcache stats. Uh, it, it depends on your storage, and I think every storage should provide a tool for that, for cache hits. If you want to look at the page cache hits, that's what you're looking for? Well, well any, anything. Let's say you're using you know, Drupal Core, you know, the cache storage right in the database. Does Drupal Core provide any, any stats, or maybe Devel does, or anything like that, to show you what your cache hits are? So... Uh, So Web Profiler extension give you some information about that. It's part of the Vel module right now. It was merged. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, hi. Uh, about the bubbling, um, I was uh, thinking, uh, is it the entity reference also taken care of? So I'm modifying an entity. Uh, and does it uh, also bubble up to the ref uh, where it's referenced? Mm, I'm not sure. It depends on how interreference module does that. It does. But I assume it does. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, it does. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Hi, hi. Um, we have a problem in our Drupal 7 uh, modules and um, sites, and I think Drupal 8 might be the same problem. Just double checking. So we have like a site wide block, like um, popular nodes and this block shows on every single page and have 10,000 pages if one one node becomes less popular the output of the block will change and would that mean that it's going to refresh every single page on site oh no 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 i can take that uh, uh, okay okay uh, let's 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 uh, talk about placeholder first yeah i thought about doing placeholder That's thing placeholder but on, on your presentation yesterday you said it's not good to placeholder and everything, so we no, uh, actually... But that's not everything, that's just one block. No, right? this is one block. We have <laughs> other blocks which work the same way. Some of them are, have like contextual filters and they, they take the argument from the page and then build something. And some of the pages will have the same block many, many places. So yeah, placeholders could be, but we have yeah. other blocks that work the same way and should not placehold everything. So is there a way out? Right, so either one of those two techniques, e either JavaScript or placeholdering, is what's available right now. So it depends on your yeah, actual I case. That. <laughs> Thanks. There is edge side well. Yeah, yeah. It, you can use with placeholders. So if you have a situation where you have one entity configuration system that is being output through a um, page attached alter, I think it is, or hook page attaches, page, page attachments, um, and the output depends upon both, say, the entity configuration, or th the entities values and then um, kind of any token in the entire system um, and its own custom configuration things. Uh, any recommendations on how to invalidate the render output if the custom entities are changed? So it, it's a relationship that is only defined during the output rendering. Hmm. <laughs> it, does the cache tags uh, resolve your issue? I mean, if you put your custom entities, uh, all of them in the tags? Um, haven't tried yet, please. 
it's a little more complicated than that. Um, so the problem is doing hook page attachments. Um, you kind of don't have any idea of where to put that cacheability metadata. The idea is you create a render array, and then you call Drupal uh, service renderer uh, at cacheable dependency for the node that you are adding, that you are getting information from. Now you have a render array that's having this perfect information, but you don't know what you do with it. But there's one simple thing you can do to get that information, you just render it. So then you render it via the renderer and be actually using that in core as part of the URL generator because we were losing metadata back and forth everywhere. And so, um, with that technique, you just render it, and then you won't lose it, and anything that's kind of coming after the page attachments will still catch that, and um, that should still work. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? All right. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>